Hello, my name is John Solomon, and I'm here uh, with the Good Faith Cybersecurity Researchers Coalition in the latest of our video chats with stakeholders related to responsible disclosure of cybersecurity vulnerabilities and legal challenges and protections, protections pardon me, for researchers and such disclosure. This is a video series put out by the GFCRC, which in turn is an initiative of the Cybersecurity Advisors Network, or CYAN, a not-for-profit global trust network of information security professionals in areas like technology, policy, management, and other specializations with a public service and a societal benefits portion to its mission. These videos are designed to be educational, as well as an opportunity for key stakeholders in areas related to or somehow relevant to responsible vulnerability disclosure and protection of these researchers to get their points across, to learn a little bit about what their points of view are, what their challenges are, and how they see this uh, very important relevant topic for the cybersecurity sector progressing. I'm here today with Pete Aller. He is not only a board member of the MITRE CVE program, uh, so Common Vulnerabilities and Exploits, but also Senior Director of Product Security uh, for Red Hat. And I'd like to ask Pete a couple of questions today about not only the open source aspect of vulnerability disclosure, but also how this affects CVE, as well as their various industry participants and stakeholders. And would like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, say a few words about where you come from, what you do, and uh, any other topics that you'd like to use to uh, say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, Pete Eller. Uh... The key point I want to bring up about the CVE is actually it's not a MITRE program. MITRE is a secretariat. We're actually an independent uh, organization. I, my apologies. I always thought it was a. I, I just learned something today, actually. <laughs> oh, it, it's it's one of those things that uh, people uh, over time they have associated with MITRE because MITRE uh, actually hosted it as uh, on the URL. So you may have noticed instead of MITRE.CVE.org, you know, it actually is now CVE.org. But that's okay. You know, this is part of the learning experience as things change. They always do. Uh, we just evolve and, and, and work through that. Uh, so, and over my Red Hat job, uh, I am a product uh, uh, security guy. I get to work with the portfolio and do things like our secure development lifecycle and uh, our incident response, which I think uh, kind of keys into a lot of stuff here around the CVE. And we're a CVE naming authority, or CNA, for both Red Hat and for Fedora. And we're also a root CNA, or open source, which means that we're working within the CVE system uh, to help expand the uh, workload and and not have C have MITRE always in the middle of that entirety so that they're not everything everyone else sees. And if you hear noise in the background, someone's alarm down the street went off. Well, no worries. I have a bunch of cats that that cater well around here sometimes as well, so that's to only be expected. Can't hear it. Um, now, I, I I did a little bit of reading up on on your background before we we um, we we started here, and uh, one of the things I I saw was that when you know you joined the CV board. One of the points made, I believe it's a it's a Medium article that was sent, um, was that you wanted to enhance cooperation between the the open source community. Of course, Red Hat is historically one of the the big players in this in this arena, and and CVE. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I've been around uh, CVE for, you know, I would say more in the fringes for for I actually hate to say this decades, and have done a lot of work with like CVSS and. Um, uh, at one time, I actually was the operations uh, director for uh, the ITI SEC, the Information Technology Information Sharing Analysis Center. So I believe that there's a robust system where we exchange information about security issues. And as things have evolved, a lot of people have moved into having open source as part of their proprietary code. There's not a great understanding sometimes amongst even security professionals about how open source works and how we work through the various communities. So the emphasis that uh, I've been driving from Red Hat within Red Hat, both as our CNA duties, but also the reason we became a root was to drive greater understanding and adoption of, of open source principles and approaches into what we do uh, in software globally. So that means you have to actually be a bit of an ambassador. Not that we, Red Hat, nor I, 
can talk for all of open source. That would be a little bit of a ludicrous statement. But the fact that there's an interest and a need to know this, because sometimes people make assumptions about open source that, well, let's say they're not really based on a lot of fact or they're not fully how things operate. So that was my reason for wanting to do that. And uh, one of the reasons why I was asked if I would join the board, uh, what my interest areas would be. So that was one of them. Well, at the very latest, log four shell should have been a wake up call. And I mean, I really mean at the very latest that that open source components are a potential serious critical entry point for 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 threats and threat actors. And you know, I'm my full disclosure. I'm I'm part of a small investment consortium of a bunch of uh, CISOs and security professionals, and two out of our 14 portfolio startups are are specifically focused on identifying and remediating open source vulnerabilities. And they're fairly new, so I think this is a topic that's gained a lot of traction in the last, I'd say, two or three years. So that's that's good to hear. Um, in your role as, I mean, your role as ambassador, you also have a lot of background in areas like, you know, working with NIST, working with IT, and a few other organizations. Can can you talk a little bit about, you know, not just specifically, but but also including um, your relationship and your your perspective on the open source community? And bringing this to these uh, information security related initiatives, you know, communicating challenges, vulnerabilities, et cetera, to these these groups. Oh wow, there's uh, so many directions you can launch from there. I, I love I love putting these really broad questions because it just gives people a playground where they can talk about something, whatever's near and dear to them. Well, one of the one of the things I when I first got here and I was looking at some of the things about they talked about how Red Hat did this or did that in the CVE program. I said, well, wait a minute, why are we the pardon the pun, the redheaded stepchild. Um, and so it was a matter of how do you engage? And I've done engagement, like I said, with the IT ISAC and, and the other multi-sector ISACs. I used to be a board member on FIRST, the Forum for Instrument Spot Security Team. So I very much got to see a global uh, way of approaching things. And the fact that just because somebody does it differently doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that's how their industry or the organization works. So how do you socialize that? And when you start working on some ISOs like for vulnerability disclosure or things of that nature or standards like uh, the CSAF standard underneath OASIS um, or, or CVSS underneath FIRST, you start, you have to look at broader things. How, how does this really work? Um, so I, I really believe in leaning forward into things. So as Red Hat, we lean forward into reinvigorating our, our work with CVSS and CVE with OSSF, um, with a host of others. The, and so what do we do? And, and, and the challenge is that you can't have a single person perspective. So internally, I asked for us to have a, a, an informal group. It's actually turned a little bit more formal. Um, it's not hierarchical. Uh, of those who are interested, and we have to exchange information. So every time we go to one of these other meetings, we come back with, well, what took place? What was the decisions? Where are they going? Uh, comments that we made. Um, and contribute. Really say, let's contribute. So for CBSS, um, I found out a little bit after the fact, but my folks had contributed uh, a, a new calculator for version four. For CVE, uh, we committed a lot of code uh, after talking about uh, use cases and um, and testing them, you know, what were the objectives? We committed code, uh, a large set of code. We also help pen test things because that's how you move things forward. And most people don't look at the security community as an, as an open source upstream. And when I said that internally, people kind of look at me and go, I've never thought of them as upstream, but they are because they're community-based. So lean into it. Um, and that means you'll get to talk to folks. I had a meeting uh, this week with the National Vulnerability Database, and we were discussing things that we observe, things that they're challenged with, things that we're challenged with, and then how do we mutually support each other. So that that's an area where I look to 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 grow. But every one of these opportunities are there. You just had to treat them like open source. In other words, it's a community base. It's a community input. And realize that you don't have the answer for everything but you might have a perspective that others don't. You have input to others don't. And then work on what's the common good. And and I find that it works very well. It, it has worked very well for Red Hat. It's worked very well for the community. So that's my approach. 
And that's an, that's something actually wanted, I wanted to, to, to follow up on, that, that very contributory um, ethos, philosophy, approach, whatever you want to call it, is one of the foundational principles of open source as a, as a concept, open source software. Now, in, in the past, it's not all what you, you mentioned early on in, 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 your, in, your, in your statement just right now, that, that we're seeing a lot of open source components as part of uh, commercial software products. You know, and historically, there's always been that kind of tension between, between you know, commercial vendor software products and open source, occasionally driven by different licensing concerns, whatever. Um, have you seen any issues from, let's say, commercial software vendors using, let's say, open source library components in terms of adopting security bug fix fixes in a, a, a timely and, and consistent manner? Or is this something that has been largely resolved over the last few years? Well, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, other incident response teams. So I have an incident response team as well as my sale team. But uh, I'm also the co-chair for Underneath First, the PSERT SIG, Product Security Incident Response Team, Special Interest Group. And so we meet every three weeks and we share challenges. We talk about what is that we do that's different from a CSERT. And there's a services framework that kind of describes that. Um, everyone uses open source. Everyone. Now the question is, how do you fix open source? So I'll talk about it from a Red Hat perspective. I, our idea and approach for fixing open source is go upstream. Go to the community I mean, project yeah. that mentioned. Yeah. And there, there's a logic for that. And the logic is you don't fork the code all over and make it hard for everyone else. And you're contributing to the whole. So you're making it security the whole. And in the process, you're looking to have more eyes on it to actually adjust, uh, look at it and make sure it's whole. That's the objective. Some people call that's the theory, but we do that as a practice. So as Red Hat, we work with a lot of other vendors, uh, so are proprietary and they use open source code. So when we run into a problem and that's a royal we, that means all of us in the interest response circle, we may have to collaborate on that. What's the extent of this? Do we understand it broadly? Okay, where do we get it fixed? Where is it upstream that we can all consume it properly? And that goes to how do we solve it and fix our problem sets? Now, you can look at Log4j and say, wow, you know, that went kind of weird initially. I'll just leave it at that. But there was a lot of what, what do we do as a community? And so a lot of people were committing code. And sometimes it's very fast. And I hear a lot of people say, well, you got to go to the latest version, you got to go to the latest version. It's like, Mm, do you really need to go to the latest version? That's actually a really common challenge I've seen because in you know, one of these startups I, I mentioned before that we talked to, they've they've actually claimed to have found a way to integrate uh, vulnerability bug fixes into previous releases from existing newer versions without a code fork or without having to upgrade to the latest and greatest. So that's a that's a free we do that all the time. That's a that's backporting and rebasing. And most people, you know, I was, I was talking to some of the software building material forms, uh, industry, uh, getting together with a CISA DHS, uh, hosting the calls. And we're talking about, oh, latest version, latest version. I said, don't you guys backport? Well, what's backporting? You know, when 70% of the participants need that be instructed on what backporting is, there's a challenge. Absolutely. And the moment you start talking, for example, the less mature organizations or, um, you know, entities that can't do that internally, uh, there's a big, there's a big gap there all of a sudden. So if there's somebody out there doing it or helping you do it, then that's, that's going to be, that's going to be valuable. Now I, I do want to be a bit annoying about, you know, back to the log for shell or log for J issue. I mean, on the one hand, the very fact that it was found via, I believe, wasn't it a Minecraft issue and, 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 and fixed as a result of that kind of shows the, 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 the viability of exactly that community model. On the other hand, there's, I, I don't know if you're familiar, you probably are, but this is a wonderful XKCD um, comic I'll link you to, which shows a whole huge structure of building blocks. Yeah, I know. It, it looks like uh, the Django blocks. Yeah, well, one side is held up by a little tiny one, you know, some some exotic library component, you know, that's been updated by some guy in Iowa for the last 20 years, holding up the whole structure. 
Now, th- that's an argument that's frequ- frequently trotted out by, by um, I see, critics of the community model. Oh, you mean the same people who are using it, right? The same people who are using it, exactly. Maybe without yeah. even knowing yeah. it. Yeah. But, but see, you know, okay, since you brought up the law of 4 shell, um, you know, Mark Cox went up to the White House to explain that. And he's over at the Apache Software Foundation. And he had to work through all that. And he had uh, open uh, source software foundation and Linux foundation also there. And what was the sum of the conversation that not everyone wants to talk about? Open source is not about throwing money at it. And there's some large corporations throwing money. We're going we're gonna to hire and recreate this uh, security operations center. And it's going to have three people that's going to do something. Are you serious? That's not going to do squat. You had to contribute code. That's what's going to work. You know, we had a DNS mask issue and there was a, a, a problem where one individual was missing. He was the creator of that problem. He's, well, he created the code. I won't say he created the problem, but he was out of pocket for several months. What do we do? We, we talked with others in the industry and we wrote code to go and we're ready to publish when he came back and looked at what we had, made his modification, and that's what went as a fix. So, you know, it's a matter of coordination, collaboration, and contribution. Contribution is the part that's missing. And that, that's that's one I want to touch on because I think that's that's arguably also an indicator of 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 maturity in at management level for especially larger, better resourced organizations. When they do make do or when they do have original research, they create bug fixes themselves. In open source components, they ba- they allow contribution back to the community so everybody can share it because they realize that you know the the ISAC model sharing is caring, right? Um, I was at FSI SAC for 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 nine years. So. Okay. Yeah, well, I started the ITI side back uh, back in uh, two thousand. Yeah, so <laughs> very familiar with that. Um, so um, let me let me let's let, let's let's change tack a little bit to the legal side of things because this is this is I think the fundamental challenge we're facing right now. Now now. The, we've referred to this in a couple of our conversations in other videos frequently. The U.S. Department of Justice, I think, set a really good um, tone for the conversation around you know the, the 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 stereotypical legal challenges for responsible vulnerability researchers. You know, whatever that defines. Obviously, the Computer Fraud Misuse Act, or CFAA rights, Computer Fraud Abuse Act in the U.S. Um, has a very very specific definitions for a computer, a protected computer, et cetera. Um, prior to the announcement that they would not, that the DOJ would not prosecute actively responsible researchers, did you see a a tendency for law enforcement prosecutors and judges to really want to go after people who? publish uncomfortable findings when, when, you know, no. not at all. No, uh, back in the day, I used to do the disclosures for X-Force, one of those internet security systems. And, uh, let's just say we kind of pushed the envelope a lot. Um, I've never had a corporation say, oh, we're going to go after you, you know, um, I had one hint. The only time I saw law enforcement is when when somebody took and misappropriated the finding as their in a, their personal property, and and took that out uh, in a public way and 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 flaunted it and it was investigated but it was never prosecuted. So, I think the the part is that in a couple industries, uh, I won't name them, but uh, they've had their attorneys from individual corporations within the larger industry threaten that part now you can look at who made the disclosure and how they went about it how they sensationalized it which of course put it into an adversarial basis so the question is who threw the rock first notice it was missing collaboration communication and contribution if you look at that if you are communicating you're collaborating you're contributing i haven't seen a issue go sideways and i've done disclosure for I was pretty active for almost 16 years, 16, almost 17 years. 
So, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people jump up and down about that. And there's some research that's well, but in my case, you know, in, in those cases when I've seen that, they've not read the prior art. The, the stuff that's been published about vulnerability disclosure. You know, you ask them who Rainforest Mug Puppy is, and most of them have no clue. Okay. Uh, did they look at the NIAC disclosure gu guidelines back in, what, 2004? Okay. Look at the coordinated vulnerability disclosure stuff that first did uh, back in 2017, 2018. Or look at the uh, ISO, was it 29174 and 300, 30111. Okay, now, uh, you know, should ISO make those a little bit broader? You know, that's another uh, point. But there, you can, if you search, you can find that stuff. It's out there. Or if you don't know somebody, there's lots of people who do bug bounty programs, represent folks, or you can actually reach out to some of the larger uh, uh, vendors, open and proprietary, and they will give you points of contact. Search CC, okay, uh, Cert FI, JP Cert will all help you do that. So it's a matter of doing a little research and coordinating and communicating, okay? In this industry, I don't think there's more than two degrees of separation for me to get to most folks. In, in a large part of them, they're one degree. So getting out and getting to the right person is the challenge and most of them just haven't taken the time to research it. I'm ready to throw it across. And then be prepared to answer the question. How did you do this? Do you have a proof of concept? What was it set up on? Because those are always the standard questions. And some researchers, and I'm not saying all, this is occasional. Well, they, they didn't finish that off. Okay. I can think of a sudden mailbug somebody threw out and it was a real challenge. And um, even Sir CC couldn't get it. You know, my researchers were able to to work it. Of course, I had to push real hard for us to do that. Um, that's probably about, uh, I can't remember the year. I think it was like 2010. Um, so realize, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't know what it is that we're looking at and you have to communicate. And that communication sometimes looks like to some people stalling. Well, let me, let me ask provocatively then. I mean, why did the DOJ make that announcement? I mean, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm collecting a lot of different points of views on their challenges from their own. There's a couple people, uh, who, who like to run around and talk to the legislators and make that this is a huge deal. And, um, you know, it's good for a business model. All right. So, well, I had a conversation with a, with a, a, a very established, you know, hacker group recently in Europe and they, their response to, you know, our, our statement of mission, the GFCRC statement of mission to help ameliorate the legal situation, or at least clarify that was, I, I found quite, I don't want to say aggressive, but very, 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 very clear that you mentioned bug bounty programs that, that they really didn't seem to like the idea, the very idea of bug bounty programs. Because it, I'm with them. In their view, it creates perverse incentives. Why, why, why don't you like them? Can you talk a bit about that? Well, they do provide incentives. They're incenting in the way that uh, the receiving organization would like to you to focus them. Okay, let's let's call it. It is a business model. Um, and so you know, don't look here. Look here, and I'll reward you here is the probably the the way the group looks at it and uh i don't think they're wrong okay don't, no. don't, don't don't look here i mean what do you mean by that in other words this is my older software i want you to look at my brand new shiny thing and you can help me pen test it that's essentially what's going on now it's a i'll say an unguided pen test okay i mean you can go look at anything you want and and uh it may yield uh, great results or it may not, or, you know, you found something and, and sometimes people try to make more of it than, than sometimes it is. That's all part of life. Okay. Uh, but you know, to me, a bug bunny program is really about, I'm trying to incent 
outside groups to look at certain things. This is where I'm taking my portfolio. Please look here. There's nothing wrong with that. I just think that, you know, if you stand behind your portfolio, it's the entire portfolio. Including including older versions, older releases. Yeah. Now, whether or not we will fix them is a, is a different story. Okay. Because sometimes, you know, in the, in the customer world, sometimes people like to hang on to something for a longer period of time. Um, and we you know, by, by, by running older, older versions of, of, for example, open source software. Well, yeah, but you know, there's a reason that all software updates over time is because usually you find enough challenges or yeah, there's a new function, the features, but when you find, um, over time, a set of bugs, there's times to, to adjust that. And, and quite frankly, um, going and trying to fix all the monitors and lows and, and a piece of software it's probably easier to do it with a brand new update of that software that that includes all open source stuff, but it includes all proprietary as well. That's a, that's an all software problem. It's not an open source problem. It's an all software problem. We just happen to talk about it as open source because, well, we're not calling out anyone else's software, but it's everyone's software problem. Fair enough. Well, I think, I think the, the, in 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 vendor software, proprietary software space, it's probably a. I'm going to go out on a limb and say a bit easier to enforce it because it's tied to uh, things like support contracts. So is ours. Well, I mean, if you're running if you're running a random open source component that's not, for example, vendor supported, right? You're you're okay. a random company. There's no vendor support for it anyway you're going to probably be less necessarily inclined to upgrade that than if a vendor, whether it's an open source vendor like Red Hat or, you know, commercial vendor X comes and says, well, if you don't upgrade this, then we are not going to help you anymore. So you're basically paying for nothing. Well, you know, this goes back to the collaboration contribution parts. Okay. In our model, in the model, I would suggest for anyone else, you know, it's not restricted to, to Red Hat, just that we use it. You know, a proprietary software can just as easily contribute that open source. So if you find a problem, you can suggest here is some code to help overcome that problem. You know, sometimes it's not the thousand lines of code. It's three or four lines of code. You can certainly put an engineer on that for, for a little bit of effort. It's not about the money. It's about the contribution. If you understand the problem, it is open source. Contribute what is the solution to it. Provide it upstream, fix it on a rev there, and let everyone benefit. Okay. Now, not not to put words in your mouth, but just the way the way I interpret your your last couple of statements is, you don't see one of the major challenges right now as being, at least in the U.S. Don't know how you feel about other jurisdictions, specific legal threats to to researchers publishing research, whether civil or criminal. Well, you get into a complexity where it's not just simple research, okay? Because um, people will look at intent, and intent sometimes is proven by past actions, okay? So I'm not calling any particular example out. But if your past as a group is that you did certain things that were, let's call it, focused on ransomware, malware, viruses, then the question is, what's your intent? Even though you have great intent, the recipient doesn't know that. This is the basis about communication. Because in the end, when you do collaboration, communication, and coordination, it's about establishing trust. You know, when you go to the answer response uh, communities, it's about a trust relationship. So when you come into the door and you say, I found the latest, greatest is going to break the internet, okay, we probably have heard that a few times, but how do I know you? How do I know what you bring to that table and what's your, your intent? Unfortunately, there's some organizations who don't react well to that. Those of us who've done a lot of stuff, you know, I'll say us, I'll, I'll talk to, you know, Microsoft, Oracle, Cisco, those guys, Intel, they've been at it for a while, you know? He won't have taken things to send mail. Okay. We go upstream, you know, we talk to Fedora, we talk to Linux kernel. We come in there 
And yes, we have a history, but if you don't, it's easy to go ahead and to reach out to, you don't have to go to a bug bounty program. You can go to a coordination center. You can go to other major vendor and get the introduction, but come in and be open uh, um, and, and realize that they probably heard the latest, greatest, going to break the internet thing. Uh, just come in and say, hey, we found this problem and we want to address it. Can we disclose this with you? And, and realize they're going to ask you to do coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So it is a communication back and forth. It's not to put one side over the other. It's a matter of coming together and saying, here's a challenge that we need to work. And when that communication goes sideways because somebody makes a claim, okay, I always watch when I have a researcher and engineer on there because both sides will uh, take offense at some inerrant language used. And all of a sudden, the, the, you know, it's like game on. So as an instant responder, you, you have to help both sides get past that initial, it's an emotional response. Um, my stuff doesn't stink. Yes, it does. Uh, well, well it's, it's, it's your not, stuff stinks. Well, no, it doesn't. Okay. It's not like we're in an industry with a lot of ego and, and a lot of people who maybe aren't the best at uh, communicating. <laughs> really all the no, time. you know, technical folks sometimes don't have the same skills for negotiating treaties. Okay. In some kinds, you need that kind of skill set. Um, that's not bad on I, any one group. It's just a matter of that's how we are. So account for that and understand that you have to go narrow a little bit more open and find somebody to help introduce you and get past that, that initial point. Cause it's almost always the onset of discussions that when the first three conversations that if it goes sideways, it's going to go sideways bad. Now, I, I think, I think we're, we're, we, we'd be pretty violently in agreement, correct me if I, I assume so, that, that the best course of action when you find, when you do find something is to, as you said, communication, go the correct route, go to the, the, those affected before you blast this out in big style. Look at me, look at me, how awesome I am. Something that, you know, I, I might've done as stupid college students, you know, cause I was an idiot in college. I. I'm happy to say that, you know, I've learned, I've, I've, I've grown in that, but would, I, I would, I would argue, and, and you're, you're probably going to smack me down here and I, I welcome it that the very act of, of, even if it's irresponsible, when you are announcing a vulnerability that you found publicly without having gone to those affected first in a coordinated manner, that almost automatically precludes malicious intent unless you're trying to make them look bad. But most of the time, I think you're, you're, I would, I would argue that most of the time it's simply somebody trying to, 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 um, get clout online. Look at me, how great I am rather than actually trying to find something to exploit or monetary gain. So I'm going to use a case. I'm going to go all the way back to, I think it was. 2001 or 2002, HDR chunked encoding. Okay. And um, one group had found it and disclosed it to Microsoft and they fixed it. Then the next force, we found it and uh, it was open source package. And, um, oh, here's the vulnerability and here's the open source patch and uh, have a good day. Oh, by the way, our stuff protection. Okay. Um, wow. Did that go sideways? You know, I remember my boss called me in the office says, Hey, you're going to go to this conference and, uh, um, help explain what we did and, and all that. And I says, do I get a flag fest? He said, no. And I went there and, uh, the, the there were arrows about the size of telephone poles. Um, and it was very contentious. I had to work people real hard. That became my job. That's how I got into disclosure because we stepped on it, stepped on it bad. Um, so like I said, there, there's plenty of examples of how not to do it. And, and some of us are still around that, uh, we're there and we can show you the scars of what we did. Um, you know, you can even say that a part of the reform crowd, if that's what you really want to go to. Um, but it was just a matter of, we had to change our stripes. You know, it's easy to go out there and claim, 
I broke everything and, and, then these guys suck and, and they don't hear and, and they're not doing the right thing. And, you know, there's all sorts of phrases like that. They've been used all sorts of times before. Um, but the real question I have to ask is, was your intent to do good and fix things? If so, take a breath. I'm not saying you're wrong, but if it's wrong, it'll be wrong tomorrow. Taking a breath really helps. It's like, you know, they often uh, talk about is you get this email and you just got to write, you, know, you type that thing out, put it back in the draft. Let it sit there for a little bit. Come back to it in four hours, 24 hours, uh, look at it and go, well, I think I'm going to reword that. And you often do. It's well, that's, the same. That's, that is wise counsel for anything involving a keyboard, not just anything around vulnerability disclosure, I think. So, so something that, that I think all of us could benefit from. I'm so, so, something about disclosure though okay well how do we communicate disclosures email web form text do any of those really express what you would do in a conversation a lot of times intent is misunderstood and you know let's look at it in the united states english is a second language we don't speak the king's english Okay, so if I don't speak the King's English and I can speak English to somebody in the United Kingdom, do we really always understand each other? Well, no, it's not just English. I mean, every every single language, and I'm a native German, I'm a native German English speaker, and, and in German, for example. Yeah. I German versus, you know, Bavarian, okay? I mean. No, even though te text does not convey intent, text does not convey context, and no. that's a really an issue. But the lingua franca for, for, for IT and security is. Usually, usually English, and um, it, it just realizes that doesn't convey. So that's why I say stop and think because it doesn't convey. I I can talk to my peers and I know that you know. Oh, you didn't mean that. No, you took the intent wrong. Okay, so what do we tell each other? Pick up the phone. Of course, it's really a, a, lot, a Zoom call or WebEx or G or some other medium like that. Okay. But it's the same thing because the intonation is different. Okay. And I, that is, it's, that's where communications of disclosure go haywire is in communication. That's a, that's a common thread in a lot of the conversations I've been having recently is that is, 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 you know, an, another good one that, that ties into that is that one of my, my, my counterparts uh, said recently was also try to think about the other guy's situation. Why, yeah. why Why would the person you're talking, the organization you're talking to not want this vulnerability disclosed immediately? You know, the example that so he- That goes interpersonal uh, skills and cross-cultural communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went back to my army roots when I used to be in the Green Braves. Okay, geez. It's a, it, it is people. In the end of the day, you're dealing with people. Yes, you have a technical problem. You think that you have the technical fix. Okay. Bring it forward. I, uh, we did a, a group where uh, they came in and found a problem. It was a TLS issue. They were very concerned about getting credit for that. A group of vendors, big vendors, took it on and researched. Go, holy mackerel! Oh, this is a problem. This problem is so big that the RFC is incorrect. The specification is wrong. We need to change that. How do you change the specification with telling one that everything is broken? It took us months, but we got it. When I say months, it took over nine months. Then we still had to do a fix. Well, here's an issue I think that you're going to run into, for example, with, um, I'm, I'm, oh God, I'm younger researchers. Um, you're a lot of, you know, for example, people at university level or directly off university level in their 20s or even their late 20s may, may not have the understanding or the patience to go through these long-winded, often political processes to get something done the right way, knowing full well that this is going to take their, their full attention over the next maybe few months, maybe longer than that, to actually make that fundamental structural change and get that through. Well, the, the, I don't think it's just people nowadays. It's not things, but people over time. Uh, I think it's been exacerbated because the, you know, instant on and instant response. Um, 
But if you found a hairy problem and you believe it's a hairy problem, it's a hairy problem that takes time to fix. Okay. Because you're dealing with ecosystems. You're not dealing with a piece of code. If you really have a hairy problem, believe that your piece of code affects a lot of things. So when you do it, you got to think through it. Look at Log4j. How many iterations? Because I went through it real quick. We went through what? Four iterations? Three, four? I don't remember exactly. And bam, 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 bam. Okay. Um, wow. What happened? Race to solve and didn't look at the problem. And you need a little bit then just a couple of eyes to look at the problem. Because if you found that hairy problem, I'll go back to, uh, I'll even name the group as Phone Factor. Okay. When they did that, it took eight large vendors to research that and find the scope, which was beyond what they had initially found, allowed them to take credit for that. But that scope was a problem. And then it was an IRC problem. And then it was a matter of how do we implement the IRC because you got to get browsers and servers to talk to each other. Oh, and, and don't do it in any competitive manner. My main, my main exposure to it was uh, dealing with the, the threat intel guys on the incident response guys on the operation side who were just pissed off that they had to keep answering the phone of the CISO all, 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 at, all, all weekend because all of these things, as you well know, always come on a Friday afternoon as a rule. So Friday afternoon, you know, I had one just uh, a week or so ago, but, you know, Friday afternoon, it's like, bam, that, you know, it's like old times. But the, the challenge is... Murphy's second law, Murphy was an optimist, right? That's right. How, 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 you know, how, how many people do you bring back? And it's, it's, you know, people, I think disclosure's misnamed. Okay. There's a notification in a disclosure. There's a coordination. There's a remediation. And then there's a series of notifications. And this is where a lot of groups get upset. You, you're going to tell one, you, you got to release it publicly. It's like, uh, the ecosystem isn't built that way. Because if you really have a hairy problem, you've got to do something to protect the broad masses. And that doesn't mean everyone works on it all at the same time. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of people who will take uh, advantage of that vulnerability and look to uh, break into some very serious things. So, you know, great, great opportunity, but it's also great weight. And, and they're, you know, they're looking for it's a it's a fast flash and I can move on to the next thing. It's like, uh, move on to the next thing. It's not going to be done real quick. Well, I mean, most, most, uh, hopefully all, but I'm not going to claim all, but, uh, most, uh, at least good CVD, uh, frameworks will include the, the finesses that you mentioned, the different types of, you know, whom to notify, when to notify, et cetera. But do you think we would benefit as an industry, as a, as a, in your words, an ecosystem, um, from a more precise and granular approach to how we deal with vulnerabilities when found? In my spare time in the future, um, I plan to address part of that. I've talked to uh, a whole series of uh, folks in, in the industry about that. And we agree, but, you know, sometimes in the middle of the uh, other part of the fight, it's hard to get to that. The old saying, you know, I'm here to drain the swamp, but right now I'm wrestling with the alligators. Mm. Plural. Yep. That's I like that expression. I'm going to steal that. That's that's consider that uh, <laughs> co-opted. Um, uh, that's all right. You you can take it because I, I I did an adaptation to uh, a great friend of mine. He's another organization. He and I used to work together, uh, and we are best buds. And um, I said to him literally yesterday, uh, "This is." Uh, I know I'm here to drain the swamp, but I'm wrestling with the alligators. He started to laugh. I says, I wouldn't mind it was the alligators. It's the snakes that are bothering me. Um, you mentioned you mentioned earlier, just to kind of, as my, my last question here, sorry, I'm conscious of time, is uh, you, you mentioned the the plethora of channels and entities out there. You know, cert.fi was one of them, obviously, first in some of its offshoots, uh, where somebody can get inf not only information about how they should deal with something that they found, but also how they should communicate it afterwards. Now, some of these have been around for ages. Some of them, national cybersecurity centers and their policies, industry organizations are fairly recent. But 
we are seeing an evolution in in and we've been seeing this for a while but i think we've seen an acceleration of the last few years in 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 the types of resources and awareness of how somebody who finds an issue should then disclose communicate whatever you want to call it notify where do you see the current major gaps and challenges in whether legal whether operational whether good practices Consider this another one of these these big open sandbox playground questions that industry as a whole, software vendors, consumers, et cetera, legislators even should address to make sure that 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 things when found get fixed faster and more effectively. You have a multi-tiered question there. Um, who to go to or how to do it? Or speed. Which part did you want to address? Well, I think just if you could pick one, pick any given major issue that you see as the current one of the current big challenges that needs to be resolved in terms of making this, you know, more dependable for industry that they can get their hands on 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 vulnerability information as it's found more effectively. How about that? So. I think from a coordination point, there's some very established uh, groups. Okay, like I said, JP Cert for Asia PAC, and and they have uh, uh, APAC uh, Cert out there. You have Certify, uh, the Dutch Cert, uh, and Cert CC. Those are the big ones. There's a lot of people who all want to break into that, but reality is. I think it, there's enough choices there and you're diluting your your opportunities when you go to others because it's it's a trust thing and there's not a lot of people who have that skill set uh, so you're you're training new folks and and that's the challenge and too many communication channels just make it uh less favorable i think there has to be a realization that if it's not your code it's a multi-vendor problem so if anyone's using your code downstream, they're part of what the, your fix is. So if you have a code upstream, you have to realize you have to engage with them. That That's the challenge that we don't do very well. If it's a broader ecosystem problem set because it's so ubiquitous, think like a DNS mass, think of like a bootloader, uh, you know, where the library's out there, you've just multiplied the problem. And it takes quite a few people to address the issue. Because sometimes the fix can be as painful as, quote, the cure, or excuse me, as a problem. Um, so you can cause other errors that you just didn't realize. So you have to examine that code. It's not always the latest route. So I think it's that we need to realize that cross-platform wise, we have to coordinate. And your question is when you anywhere in the ecosystem, you got to ask, do they do cross coordination? So Especially that's a source component. It, it, it and would, we'll, we'll kind of give you that hairy eyeball stare. Like you asked me what, because that's really what you want to know. And it's not so much for the fix at hand. It's for the fixes yet to come. So, so in a way, in a way relevant to the, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you before. Just, uh, um, to the whole the whole concept of 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 software supply chain extension of that essentially that that making people ah uh, you hit it right on the head you hit it right in the head it is software supply chain John and and most people don't realize that because it you know what's the whole reason for doing an S bomb you know and I've seen a lot of people oh it's for the developer no yeah, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm I'm a risk manager at heart so no it's not for the developer okay. <laughs> okay, what are we doing? Yes, you're, it's for the audit and and uh, procurement guys. Number one, number two is for the risk management guys. Number three is for the assurance to the company. That's for the business, essentially. Exactly. So this conversation, you know, and I love watching some of the S bomb conversations. Everyone's like, it's about the developer. It's like, ah, I think you're missing what's really going on here. It's not about the developer. It's about the supply chain and where it is in the organization, especially when you watch the EU CRA and US EO stuff talk about liability. 
much for the viability upstream. Uh, that's going to be a fun conversation as, as especially in Europe, we start talking more, 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 uh, um, intentionally about, uh, things like, uh, certification, information security certification. So. Right. right. Well, you're seeing even in disclosure, well, you got to fix everything in 30 days. It's like, uh, you have no idea how this really works. You know, it's a great statement from a bureaucratic perspective. It has no logic in reality. I think it's positive that, that the regulators are at least taking a closer look at it. They do learn usually, usually, you know, GDPR is a good example in that sense. I agree. I think very often the technical realities don't necessarily mesh with the, um, the potent, the, you know, let's say the, the well, the good intentions. I was about to say well-meaning idiots, but, uh, I'll just put it this way. Engagement will save a lot of heartburn for the poor guys who are being regulated. You know, who, whoever you're regulating, okay, is the guy who's going to suffer. So your positive intent has a negative consequence. Now, this is one of the, this is one of the things that, you know, we, we very much encourage and, and support. Uh, it's, we don't, you know, the GFCRC doesn't talk to regularly, we're not a lobbying organization, but we do talk to industry stakeholders and try to support them in finding more effective ways in talking to their legislatures in terms of their government agencies. I, I am not, I admit both fully, I'm not entirely familiar with the dialogue in the US, which tends to, from my view, be much more engaged and constructive than generally in Europe. But we do have a lot of bodies where, for example, with the EU entities, there is quite a lot of exchange. Helping to make that exchange more effective is definitely part of the equation. Um, I want to give you a chance if you want to if you want to have if you want to share any maybe parting thoughts any 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 wrap up ideas call to action here's your chance what should we know what's your big you know message for well, masses I, I will I will go with you should contribute upstream and I don't care if that has to do with it's uh, the code itself and you want to be in some open source project or community uh, or foundation do that. If you're on the security side, there's a lot of upstream in the, the things we do because it is collaborative. Uh, so it's not one organization dominating the rest of us. Uh, we do it as a collective. Uh, um, if you're a product team, there are channels to talk to other instant responders. Please look us up on first. You'll see that. Um, and really, the water's fine jump in. I, I look at it that way. Um, and I find the more we engage, the, the better off our customers are. I'll put it that simple. You know, yes, I, I, I believe in the, uh, more utopian parts of it, but I also realize I have a customer base I have to take care of. And, uh, my customer base is larger than the, those who are paying customers. And, and most people don't look at it like that. It's not just the paying customers. Is everyone who's affected by that. So um, I, I see that as a much larger challenge. And, um, you know, if you need help, reach out to all of us. Well, I think utopian sometimes has an unfortunately negative connotation. A lot of people don't realize that uh, it's actually, in addition to being the right thing to do, it, it, is, it does very often directly or indirectly contribute to, to, to advancing your own rational self-interest as well. So yeah, that's a good message. Do do contribute. Um, you know, it's, not, it's not mutually exclusive. That that's the the challenge here. It does not have to be mutually exclusive. Absolutely agree with you there. Um, I with that, I want to thank you very very much for your time. I, sorry, we've gone a little bit over our schedule here, and I, I want to be respectful of yours as well. Uh, thank you very much for your insights. Um, I will link to a lot, as many as possible, as I can pick out of the 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 organizations and concepts that Pete mentioned in the video description. Uh, I will link, if it's okay with you, to your, to your LinkedIn bio, uh, Red Hat, CVE, your other organizations that you're involved in, as well as any topics that you, you'd like to share. Also in the video description or the podcast description if you're joining us on audio only. Uh, with that, again, thank you very much. Please do visit us at gfcrc.org, uh, as well as the Cybersecurity Advisors Network at cybersecurityadvisors.network. 
and uh, hope you will join us for our, the rest of our lovely videos with our interesting stakeholders that where we discuss issues around the challenges and future of uh, coordinated and responsible vulnerability disclosure or all the other elements that you mentioned. Thanks very much, Pete. Thanks, Sean. Have a great weekend. Likewise. Thank you.